Chapter 4. The Trap At last they halted for the night near Sukkoth. Tirza's legs felt stiff and heavy, her hands swollen, and her mouth dry from the long hours of march. She was hungry and covered with fine dust. Come on, Maha urged, half supporting Neheloth, who leaned heavily on her arm, her veil draped across her mouth. Not another step could I go. I can't make it, Neheloth wailed as Maha pulled her. If only I could sink my feet into a cool Nile mud just for one hour, she grumbled. That's a dumb thing to say, Maha scolded, keeping a steady pull on her sister's arm. Just don't let father hear you say a word about Egyptian mud. Mud is mud, Nahaloth answered, and right now I'd give anything for one pot of it. Tears are grinned as she pictured Nahaloth's feet stuck in a pot of mud. Now that she was standing still, she began to feel little stabs of muscle pain in her own legs. Pushing one foot ahead of the other, she made her way to where her mother and Jerioth were already unpacking the tent. It was Jerioth who took charge. Her wide smile greeted Tirza while her nimble fingers coaxed a flame to life. Tirza undid a packet of goat's curd, glancing as she did at her mother, who rested against a pile of bundles. Her eyes were closed, her face drawn and pale with fatigue. Silently, Jerioth put a finger against her own lips, and Tirza nodded. Once her mother woke, but Jerioth smiled and insisted, Close your eyes, Leah. Rest for the baby's sake. Let me take care of the meal. The food was ready, and Tirza was hungry, but still the men had not returned from their meeting with Moses and the leaders. When they did come, it was her uncle Shabol's voice she heard first. "'Can't you see that the only safety is in speed?' her uncle was saying in a firm tone. "'We must go northeast and take the way towards Megiddo, the quickest route, the one we know is direct to Canaan. Jerahil, you are a man of good sense. You know that to go to Ethem will take us further away from the main road.' Her father threw his staff on the ground. That is all quite clear, but one thing you forget. Moses is the one God has spoken to, and he says, we go to Etham. Her mother opened her eyes and the men lowered their voices. Besides, her father said, the Egyptians keep the forts and guard stations along the main coastal route well manned. The road is shorter, but might lead straight into war. That's a risk we have to take, argued Shobal. It would be sheer folly to go wandering around in that rough country when every hour between us and Pharaoh's army counts. Hasn't the Pharaoh proved he is one whose mind changes with every breeze? Shabal turned away, gesturing to a handful of men who stood nearby listening. Come, let's not waste our time. There are others who will listen to reason. Tirza watched the men leave and wondered. Was it possible that the Pharaoh would send his army after them? She looked questioningly at her father. He was not tall, but he was muscular, his fingers strong as he kneaded her shoulder, gently. Child... Never mind, Shobal. Moses has brought us this far, and we must trust in Yahweh's chosen to lead us the rest of the way. He flashed a wary smile at her, and Tirza felt warm inside. Her father's word was good enough for her. A cool evening wind sprang up, smelling of night things, mysterious and strange under the star-brilliant sky. Not for a long time had Tirza noticed the stars. These were large, so bright, almost like a covering above the camp, stretching as far as she could see. She was glad not to be inside the tent tonight, glad, too, that she hadn't fallen asleep yet. Next to her, Oren lay stiff and silent. "'Are you awake?' she whispered, knowing that he was. "'Yes.' The answer came in a small, hard voice. All day he had insisted on walking until Abishur had carried him. Later, Tears' father had made him ride in the cart with old Hannah and the little ones to practice the flute and cheer the children who were restless. Oren, are you in pain? Why should I be? He gritted his teeth on the half lie. Tomorrow he would grit them again, and the day after that. Oren, look at the stars. The signs are good. See how they line up? Almost like a shining pathway, as if they were showing us the way to the new land. She sighed thinking of the land that waited for them. Who lived there now? What would the houses be like? She would plant a garden first thing. Oren, did you hear father say that Yahweh planned this journey a long time ago? Those same stars shone on Joseph hundreds of years ago. Maybe on the night he made his children vowed to take his body with them when they left Egypt. I know, Oren mumbled. I saw Aaron and the others carrying the box with Joseph's bones inside. Oren was silent, remembering the sight of the draped coffin, how he would love to see inside that box. Oren, Tirza murmured, think of it, no more Egypt, we're free. She could hear her own voice growing sleepier. Oren turned his head away and looked up at the sky. He was free, but why did part of him still feel like it was missing? Was Passer alive? Had Yahweh accepted his sacrifice? He looked hard at the stars, trying to see behind them. Silently he prayed, Lord, will you have mercy on old Passer? He was good to me, and I can't help it. I, I love him. 
Tears wet his cheeks and cooled in the breeze as he closed his heavy eyelids. In the morning, the ram's horn sounded once more, echoing throughout the camp from tribe to tribe, calling the people to gather. Another day in the sun, Tirza grumbled. She could feel the heat already. Maha had pinned her thick black braid into a coil above her neck and caught one of the pins in her head covering. Sweat dripped from her nose as she struggled to free the cloth. At least the afternoon will be better with the sun behind us, she said, sighing as the knot of braid loosened. Oof, there will be nothing left of me by the time we reach the new land. Tirza hid a smile, looking at Maha's round, red face and plentifully filled robe. Nahalath laughed at her sister. Mother says the new land is filled with milk and honey, so I suppose, Maha, it will not hurt you to lose a little weight before we get there. Tirza glanced down at her own skinny frame, her robe covered with fine dust. Dust was everywhere. She shook her skirt and brushed away the little cloud that rose from it. Turning to escape the dust, she faced east for the march to Etham. In the sky was the strange, white, cloud-like mass that had hung there ever since dawn. It was huge, almost silvery white as if it were filled with light. What could it be, Tirza? Maha asked in a hushed voice. Behind the girls, Jerioth's voice spoke. Molid said it is the presence of Yahweh. He has come to guide us on our journey. While they watched the huge cloud-like column, it seemed to Tirza that it moved. As she started, the cloud did move. It was leading them, going ahead of them. Tirza clapped her hands and laughed. The cloud was going toward Etham. Her father was right, and Uncle Shobal would have no choice but to admit it. When the cloud stopped, the long line of march halted for rest and food. When the cloud moved on, the people moved on. Nothing like this has ever been in this world before, Tirza whispered to herself. But by the time the cloud stopped for the night, she was dusty, weary, and aching in every muscle. Etham, on the edge of the desert, was beautiful, with palm trees and wells. When it was her turn at the well, Tirza filled her water skin quickly. How clear the water looked as it splashed into the goat skin. She drew enough for the family and hurried back to the campfire, glad that Oren would care for the goats and sheep. Lazily, Tirza bit into one of the sweet dates that clustered on the palms. She let it linger on her tongue a while before she swallowed it. From where she sat, she could see little circles of fire like theirs dotting the horizon. In the east, the cloud of mystery hovered like a burning red-gold column that seemed to fill that part of the night. She could barely turn her eyes from it. It was like a glorious sunset that didn't die away or go down. Tears aside for the wonder of it. Her mother's commanding voice broke into her thoughts. Come, Oren, let me see those feet of yours. Why didn't you ride with Hannah in the cart? Why must you insist on walking so much? Her mother was inspecting Oren's lame leg and tears a bit her lip as Oren flinched. What should a mother do with such a stubborn son? Tirza, bring me the ointment from the medicine pack. As she spoke, she massaged the thin leg between her hands. When Tirza brought the jar of ointment, her mother looked at her with eyes that barely held back the tears shining in them. Hastily, she took the ointment and set about briskly rubbing the leg. Oren gritted his teeth and Tirza turned away. Carefully, she fed a stick into the fire. The night was not yet cold, but she knew it would be. As she bent over the low flames, hurrying feet and angry voices broke the stillness of the night. Her father strode into the firelight, ran behind him. But father, can't you see that to turn back now and go toward the Red Sea will put us between the sea and the mountains? It makes no sense at all. We should have headed for the coastal highway long ago, Ram pleaded. Tirza listened for the reply. Moses has spoken tonight, saying we go south from Etham, and so we go south. Don't I know that the sea and the wilderness are there? And doesn't Yahweh, may he be praised, know what he means to do? Her father, loud when he was angry, raised his voice. No son of mine will question the chosen God. You have been listening to that donkey of a showball. He has put these ideas in your head. Stomping into the tent, her father dropped the black goatskin curtain door behind him. Ram slumped heavily by the campfire, his face grim. Insane, he muttered. A madness to turn south and be hemmed in like sitting birds for the hunter. But what about the cloud of Yahweh? Won't it go before us to show us the way? Tirza asked. Who knows, Ram answered, jabbing at the dying coals of the fire. Surely Yahweh expects us to show reason and good sense. Moses is old. How can he be certain he is leading in the direction Yahweh is pleased with? What if the cloud only goes before us to test our foolishness? It makes no sense at all to walk into a trap. How can this be of Yahweh? Can a foolish thing be from Yahweh? Tirza shivered from the night air and from something inside. What if Ram was right? The shortest route to the land of Canaan was along the coast, but they were far from that now. On the other side of Shur was a rough track going east through the wilderness. Instead, they were turning south. Were they lost? No, that made no sense. Why then was everything so complicated, so hard to understand? Already the others were gone to their beds. 
A heaviness began to press down on Tears' eyes as she pulled her cover close. At the campfire, Ram still sat staring into the glowing coals. What if he was right? Tirza wondered. Maybe in the morning the cloud would not turn south. That would be good, she thought. The day dawned bright and hot. When the marchers again took their places, Tirza saw that the cloud had moved toward the south. Slowly the line began its march in that direction. Why, oh why was Yahweh letting them go away from the route to Canaan into what might be a trap?